Hello everyone and welcome to our module on visual fields. The visual fields of the left and right eye are divided into four quadrants for each eye and on physical exam the quadrants are tested individually. The reason it's done this way is because as we will see there are neurological disorders that result in vision loss to one quadrant or two quadrants or even all four quadrants to one particular eye or the other. In order to understand visual fields and visual field defects, we need to understand the visual system that our brain uses to perceive the world. And in order to do this, let's imagine that we have a left eye and a right eye which are gazing out into the world. And let's imagine that the right half of the world is entirely red and the left half of the world is entirely blue. Well, each eyeball, the left and the right, will create its own image of the world with the left half blue and the right half red. However, the retina flips this image when it initially begins sending signals to the brain. What this means is that the right half of the world, the red half of the world, will be perceived by the left side of the left eye and the left side of the right eye. The blue half of the world, which is on the left side in reality, will be perceived by the right side of the left eye and the right side of the right eye. Once the retina creates this flipped image of the world, it sends signals via the optic nerve. Those signals travel to point two shown in this chart, which is the optic chiasm. At this point, there is a crossing of the two sides of the world done by the right and left eye. The blue signals, which represent the left half of the world, will be transmitted over to the right side of the eye for the left eyeball. For the right eyeball, the blue signals, which represent the left half of the world, will stay on the right side. What this means is that we now have information from the left side of the world and the right side of both retinas traveling together in a structure called the optic tract. The opposite occurs for the red signals coming from the right side of reality and coming from the left side of both eyeballs. They also join together and travel in the optic tract on the other side of the body. From here, signals travel to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and at that point, they split into two projections, which go to the posterior lobe of the brain. One of those projections is called Baum's loop. The other one is called Meyer's loop. And it's very important you understand this illustration I've shown on the screen, because as we will see, defects of each of the five points in this visual system result in characteristic eyesight deficits. So that's a lot to remember, so let me highlight some key points about the visual system to keep in mind. The left side of the world is perceived by our right visual cortex and the right side of the world by our left cortex. The optic nerve, which is point one shown in this drawing here, carries signals from the left and right retina to the brain. The optic chiasm, which is point two in this drawing at the bottom of the screen, has fibers crossing from the middle of both retinas. However, those fibers on the middle portions of both retinas are perceiving the lateral world or the temporal portions of the world. And this will be important in a minute when we talk about bitemporal hemianopsia. The lateral geniculate nucleus, which I've shown in my drawing here, is found in the thalamus. It's the major termination site of the retinal projections. There are two projections from the lateral geniculate nucleus that carry signals to the visual cortex in the posterior or occipital lobe of the brain. Those are Meyer's loop, which is number five shown in this drawing. Meyer's loop is found in the temporal lobe. And the other projection is number four here. That's Baum's loop found in the parietal lobe. Now what I'm going to do is go through lesions of the different portions of the visual system and talk about the visual field defects that they produce. The first visual field defect we'll discuss is anopia. This is the easiest visual field defect to understand. It results in complete vision loss in one eyeball. As I've shown on the right side of the screen here, one eyeball will be completely black, the other one will be completely normal. This occurs when there is a defect in area one shown on the screen. In other words, when there's either a defect with the retina picking up light signals or a defect of the optic nerve carrying those light signals away from one eyeball. So this can occur if there's optic nerve compression. It can also occur when there's a left retinal lesion. One disorder that can lead to anopia that you should know for step one of your boards is optic neuritis. This is an inflammatory demyelinating condition of the optic nerve. It leads to acute monocular vision loss. And you should know that optic neuritis is highly associated with multiple sclerosis. It is the presenting feature of multiple sclerosis in 15 to 20 percent of patients. And of patients who have MS, 50 percent of them will develop optic neuritis at some point during the course of their illness. Another condition that leads to anopia is amaurosis fugax. This is painless transient vision loss in one eye. The classic description of amaurosis fugax is for a patient to complain that they saw a curtain shade fall down over their vision in one eye and then they lost vision in that eye. This is due to damage to either the optic tract or the retina and it is often a symptom of a transient ischemic attack. One of the conditions that commonly causes this is embolism to the retinal artery coming from the carotid artery. So patients who have peripheral vascular disease and have carotid artery atherosclerosis can embolize and embolize to the retinal artery and this will lead to amaurosis fugax. 
Our next visual field defect is called bitemporal hemianopsia. This occurs when there's a lesion of the optic chiasm where fibers are crossing from the left and right eyes. It results in the visual field defect pattern I've shown on the right side of the screen here, where the temporal portions of both eyes have no vision. That's why it's called bitemporal hemianopsia. Recall that the fibers that are crossing in the optic chiasm are from the medial portion of both eyes, in other words, the inside of the right and left eye. However, the inside of both retinas are picking up images from the outside of both visual fields. In other words, they're picking up lateral or temporal parts of the world. What this means is that the visual field defect that will result will look like what's on the right side of the screen, where you can't see anything on the lateral or outside aspects of both visual fields. And the classic conditions to cause this are something that compresses the optic chiasm. Specifically, this classically occurs in the setting of a pituitary adenoma or an aneurysm. Both of these conditions can compress the optic chiasm and result in bitemporal hemianopsia. And this is another picture to show you what the world would look like to somebody who has bitemporal hemianopsia. They would see on the inner portion of both visual fields, but they would have no sight on the outer portion of both visual fields. Contrast bitemporal hemianopsia with homonymous hemianopsia. This occurs when there is loss of one half of both visual fields, but it's the same half, either the left or the right. That's why it's called homonymous. This occurs when there's damage either to the optic tract or the posterior or occipital lobe of the brain. Basically, if there's damage to anything back here, the fibers from the left side or the right side of both visual fields are running together, and that will lead to homonymous hemianopsia. This can occur if there's a left PCA stroke that damages the occipital lobe or a lesion to the left optic tract. This will result in visual loss on the right side of both visual fields, as I've shown at the top side of the screen. If either of those problems, a PCA stroke or optic tract lesion, occurs on the right side of the body, that will lead to left visual loss, as I've shown here at the bottom. And this is a picture of what homonymous hemianopsia looks like to a patient. They can perceive the right side of their world in both eyes, but the left side of the world in both eyes is lost in this example. Macular sparing is a phenomenon that is often seen in homonymous hemianopsia. The macula is the central high resolution vision portion of our retina. I talk about the macula in detail in the video on the retina. The macula often has a dual blood supply from both the MCA and the PCA. What this means is that PCA strokes often spare the macula and they result in homonymous hemianopsia like I've shown on the screen where the central visual field remains intact. Our last visual field defect is called quadrantic anopia. This occurs when one quadrant of both visual fields is lost. This type of visual field defect results from damage to one of the projections, either Myers loop or Baum's loop, from the lateral geniculate nucleus to the posterior lobe of the brain. Myers loop is found in the temporal lobe, and when there's damage to Myers loop, this results in the pie in the sky version of quadrantic anopia, where the upper right-sided or left-sided quadrant is lost. This occurs in settings of temporal lobe damage. The reason I make my illustration, as I've done on the left side of the screen with number five on top, is because that always reminds me that Myers loop results in the pie in the sky. Bounds loop is point number four shown in this drawing. If you have damage to Bounds loop in the parietal lobe, that results in the pie in the floor type of quadrantic anopia, as I've shown in this illustration here. And this can be seen in the setting of parietal lobe damage. And that concludes our module on visual fields.